So we, we continue off our discussion with uh, the related series, which is uh, lecture series number 24, uh, which is then that it happens to be the last the last broad topic that we are covering. Um, which is good. Uh, and I, I think we are well on track to, to covering all there is that needs to be covered here. So, yes. No. Um, so, oh. just a, a few announcements. Um, so quiz number 18 is, is due on the 11th, um, which, which incidentally happens to be the uh, same day when we get to write class theory test number four. So brace yourself. And like I mentioned in like the last time we met, I said, I don't know where that thing is, right? I normally sit somewhere. Um, I, I'd, I'd mentioned that, that the Wednesday class is going to be more or less like uh, a revision session or something. So. Um, we'll probably continue off with logic gets over the weekend on Sunday. I think we have a class, right? We have a makeup class. And I'm, 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 I'm planning, like I suggested last time, we'll merge uh, uh, makeup, makeup session number one and two into, into the Sunday class um, on the 13th. Um, the, the thing here is uh, th there's a couple of different things happening here. So I won't be around in, this, in the week of the 21st of October. But also, um, the plan is to make sure that we are, we are done with this so that we have enough time to go through the tutorials with Nondi, right? So that last week will probably be reserved for tutorial sessions, specifically for this, um, for this, this broad topic. Um, so, yeah. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, like normally topics towards the end, right? You don't get to write tests on those things and there's only going to be one quiz on this. So you want to make sure that you attend the tutorials because there's going to be questions in the exam on this particular broad topic, right? Okay. Uh, oh, I thought I'd, I'd uh, a question or two about the, the assessment. But anyway, I'm just All right, so the, the broad introduction here is, uh, this is like a lecture outline for what we're going to cover in this particular lecture series, right? And the interesting, the, the interesting thing about some of the things we're doing right now is that you're going to, to do them in, is it 2021 or something, so-called uh, computational maths or computational mathematics, whatever it is they call it. Um, and, and so the plan is just to gloss over some of the things that you're going to, to focus more on next next year, right? I mean, we just want to focus on the more important things. So we'll, we'll just introduce this so-called Boolean algebra, algebra because it, it tends to be a fundamental building blocks um, when it comes to implementation of so-called logic gates, right? Um, and then we'll look at a whole range of Boolean operators. Essentially, the, the reason we're gonna be looking at Boolean operators really is because um, there's more or less like a one-to-one -one mapping between the operators and the different types of gates that we're going to discuss, right? So we want to understand the basics before we start uh, zeroing down on the gates. Um, and then something that we didn't do last, last year is uh, like the, so the, this, the, the normal approach is, but generally what tends to happen is you, you, you tend to use, like it could be like um, Boolean expressions to build gates, right? But the, the question sometimes could be, I mean, how would you, be able to reverse engineer an existing circuitry, right? A complex get so that you come up with equivalent uh, Boolean expressions. So I, I thought it would be interesting for us to again gloss over K maps, right? You uh, focus more on this next year, I guess. But um, and then, more importantly, maybe we look at one, two, maybe three examples on how we get to use these so-called logic, logic gates to build these hardware components that we are from discussing, right? So. So uh, the question would be, what sort of gets would we, would we use to implement um, um, a hardware component like the arithmetic logic unit, for instance? 
right? How would we use gates to implement uh, in-memory components, a right? hardware component that is able to retain values, right? Because this is what all of this is all about, right? Um, how would we use these fundamental building blocks to uh, to come up with a circuitry that implements a multiplexer, for instance, right? Um, it would be nice to look at examples here. Now, I, I like this, right? We've been talking about um, abstraction here, and just a reminder for those of us that are lost somewhere, we have a map, right? Normally, I don't know if people know how to read maps here. Yeah. Where is uh, East Park Mall here? Don't memorize it. There's maps, Google Maps these days. But we started off by looking at uh, the so called computer system, like from a very high level, right? We, we more or less like studied it from the perspective of it being a black box. So what sort of uh, basic functionality um, um, does it expose to whoever wants to use this thing? Um, and then we looked at things like, you know, uh, software, da, da, da. Um, and then we're just from focusing on this component, which is the instruction set architecture. But the question then would be, how, how exactly are these, the question we're trying to answer here is how exactly are these Instructions, how exactly do they get mapped onto the hardware, the actual hardware, right? Um, remember, we're tracing these instructions, passing through those different hardware components. So how, what sort of circuitry do they get to use, right? This is what we're interested in, in studying in this particular, um, in this particular part. Uh, and also, just to mention up front that we are abstracting a lot of things here, right? Again, we're still abstracting. There's, there's more below here, right? In fact, right below the chip design and here there's right, a lot more, but we're just abstracting so that we better understand what goes on behind, or under the hood, right, behind the scenes. Um, but something else we discussed, we've been talking about for quite some time now, is this whole notion of, uh, oh, a computer uh, works with ones and zeros. And we mentioned that the so-called ones and zeros are nothing more than a flow of current, right, electricity. Um, so depending on the implementation, and typically it's usually the case that um, a one would represent something like a high voltage. And, and high here is a bit subjective because uh, the people implementing the hardware get to decide a certain threshold that would be mapped onto a one, for instance. So when we say, you know, uh, a, a computer works with ones and zeros, what we're essentially saying is it's, it's uh, the relative flow of electricity through these different hardware components. So if, uh, if you're working with a relatively high voltage, then you know it's, it's a one. If it's a low voltage, it's a zero, right? Um, again, we're abstracting these things here. Um, another way of viewing, uh, we're trying to analyze these ones and zeros is from the perspective of um, these two states being equal to either true or false, right? So essentially we're saying, if you're dealing with, uh, with a high voltage, then essentially what you're saying is that it's true there is indeed voltage flowing through uh, the circuitry. Um, otherwise, it's false, right? <laughs> right, so, uh, so essentially all the different operations that we'd be dealing with when it comes to logic gates would either result to a one or a zero, right? It's interesting, in my opinion, right? So, so the so-called implementation of logic gates, right? I, I thought again I would take us back to something that we discussed a very, very long time ago. I lecture series number two and we were looking at the historical perspective of so-called computer systems. We, we talked about the fact that the implementation of the so-called circuitry circa second generation was implemented using vacuum tubes, right? I, I just wanted to remind you of this fact. Um, Right, so logic gates and inform circuitry and, and so obviously there has to be a way in which you, you implement that circuitry, right? So first generation computers use vacuum tubes, right? And then uh, fast forward to second generation, we said one of the uh, significant technological advancement was the so-called transistors, right? Um, and since then actually transistors have been stuck with us. Um, so important so much so, so that you can literally trace the history of uh, um, transistors from, I think, second generation up to this point in time. And do you realize that the relative number of transistors that you find in um, a computing device like, like this is significantly more than that which you probably would have found in a uh, so-called Pentium One, which came out, I guess it was in the 90s or something, right? Um, interesting statistics here. I, I don't know if there's a, they say the average 
smartphone these days, uh, chip on your smartphone has about, is it almost two, maybe three billion transistors? And so I guess, I, I suppose that kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of, how, you go about, uh, of, of how you go about using, um, using so-called transistors to build logic gates. <coughs> We're studying logic gates, but we're saying that under the hood here, under here, the implementation of this code circuitry, because the circuit is composed of logic gates, right? And so the way that you actually physically implement these logic gates is by using certain special components, right? Currently, it's transistors. Um, in first generation computers, it was vacuum tubes, right? What I'm saying is CPU chip on my phone, for instance, um, has roughly, I guess, that's what the internet says, about two, maybe three billion transistors here. Uh, right, so interesting stats here. You should go on and check these things out. And so, like I said, fundamentally, the reason we're interested in studying so-called logic gates is because we're, we're trying to better understand exactly how we get to use these logic gates to implement these different hardware components we we were discussing in the previous lecture series, right? So things like the multiplexer, for instance, you realize that uh, a typical multiplexer, like in this case, one that takes in uh, one, one signal. You remember, what, what, you remember the, the way um, the max that sits between, uh, that sits right before the, uh, I don't know if people remember this, this max here the one that sits between the AOU and the register and the immediate value. Um, it's an example, a classic example of a two to one max because it, was, it only has one input signal, right? So there's an input signal that gets to determine which value you're going to use, whether it's a value coming in from the register file or the value coming in from the immediate value, the same extent, right? Um, and lo and behold, if we were to build something like that, you'd essentially just make use of uh, four gates. Right, um, this is pretty interesting, right? Um, so this would be like your, this would be like your signal, right? The, um, the control signal that, uh, that gets to determine which value is going to be used. Um, and then this would be the input coming in, uh, like if it was this case, uh, A would be the input that comes in from the register file, and then B would be the input that's coming in from the immediate value, right? And so depending on what value comes in through X, um, the, the, the signal that gets, um, the signal that, that gets to be inputted into Y here is going to be depend, dependent on whether this is one or zero, right? Uh, which is interesting, right? Um, flow of electricity or not, right? Okay, but uh, you notice the vulnerable we're saying is a total of four gates here, but essentially, uh, for those of you that, um, uh, pretty good at this. You notice that these are pretty much the same components. So essentially we're dealing with three different types of uh, logic gates or hardware components in this case. Okay, so but, but uh, so the thing is, is digital signals are, um, are designed based on um, theory aligned with so-called Boolean algebra, right? And it's pretty much similar to this algebra we are used to. And you notice that, uh, in fact, as you read up, most of the rules that apply to uh, classic algebra, things like uh, associative rules and distributive rules actually get to apply here as well, right? Um, so fundamentally, this is a theory that's used, right? Um, I s we actually use this to actually implement these different functionalities we've been talking about, like how do we come up with an adder from something that's going to add uh, to different input values, right? Okay, so when it comes to so-called Boolean algebra, obviously, just like algebra, it's defined by values and operators, right? Um, but the interesting thing about the values that you get to interact with or work with when it comes to Boolean algebra is that there's just two different values, a one or a zero, right? Um, and then the operators that you get to work with are broadly classified into these three subcategories, so conjunction, distinction, and, and negation. Uh, and using these, these basic operations and these input values, you actually get to come up with complex expressions that you can later on use to implement the so-called logic gates. Right? Um, 
Uh, and so just like any other normal operator in, in maths, obviously you, you, you use the operator to manipulate the two input values or one input value in the case of negation to come up with an output value, right? Um, so uh, in terms of conjunction, conjunction is similar to so-called uh, multiplication, right? And it's represented by either an asterisk or a dot, a yeah, center dot. Um, sometimes it could also be represented, uh, uh, like if you're trying to, to infer that you're using um, uh, conjunction, for instance, you could, uh, conjunction using two operators, two input operators, uh, A and B, we're saying the expression could either use um, the asterisk as the operator or vertical dot or sometimes no operator at all, like just combining, <coughs> combining the two operators like so. Um, and then so-called disjunction, um, similar to addition, obviously it's represented by the plus sign. Right? Um, and both of these two different operators are actually binary operators, meaning that they, they actually involve uh, two input operands, right? So in this case, it would be A and B. Uh, so this would be um, a disjunction here. When it comes to negation, though, I mean, the operator that's used is uh, the complement uh, thing there. I think it's a, is this a carrot symbol? No, apostrophe or something. Uh, sometimes it could be a vertical bar on top of uh, an input value or I guess a single quote like so. In certain instances, I guess you would find uh, is it a value like so or something, right? One operator like this. But the interesting thing about negation is that it's an unary operator, right? Meaning that it only, it's only applied to one input value, right? So uh, A, or not A, not B for instance, right? Uh, compare and contrast this with, um, um, with the conjunction which takes in two operators. Okay. Okay. Uh, so again, because we are dealing with two input values, we can we can view those input values as being either uh, true or false, like we said. Yes, sir. Oh, what? I thought, uh, I don't know why I skipped that important bit of information there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the way it works, right? So we're saying for conjunction, we remember we're saying it's a binary operator, meaning that it takes in two values. What we're saying is that um, when you're working with two values and the values can either be zero or one, uh, you know that you have two to the power, hmm? to the power. How many combinations, how many different combinations do we have? If it's a binary operator. Two to the, two to the two, right? So what we're saying is if you're dealing with one and zero, the possible uh, values for the, for the, for the, uh, for the operands is either operand, the first operand would be zero and the second would be one. The uh, first operand would be one and the second would be zero. Um, it's either both are zero, let's follow the order here, or this would be zero and this would be one, this would be one, this would be zero, or this would be one and this would be one. So the way it works is we're saying it, it will return, conjunction will return an output of one. Once you apply conjunction on these two input values, it will return a one only when both input values are ones. So in this particular instance, it's only when conjunction will return a one, otherwise it's gonna be a zero. <coughs> I guess the, one, the reason I skipped it is because it comes up often again, it's gonna come up anyway. But for disjunction, for disjunction, um, what you're saying is that it, it returns a one if any of the input values are ones. Yeah. If you return a 
Um, Are you giving up on life? I don't know what's happening here. If your input values are either 1 or 0, or your input values are both 0, it can return a 0 in Yes, yes. It's the opposite of what I just said, so yes. Um, but, but then for when it comes to disjunction, obviously, uh, what we're saying is that if any of the input values are ones, then you return a one, otherwise it's gonna be a zero. So um, in this particular instance, in this particular instance, and in this particular instance, for disjunction, the answer is going to be one. Another way of looking at it is that you return a zero if both input, input um, or if both operands are zeros. Okay. Yes, sir. Sorry? Uh, on this disjunction, uh -huh. when you have the one and the one and the Yes. You return a one. Mm. I was trying to think of a different example here. What are the ones? I don't know. But um, so yes, my answer. Excuse me. I'm gonna move closer to him and listen attentively, and then I shall say it will come in the exam, right? This is how you punish people. But yes. Yeah, it's, it's a, for negation. It's just the opposite. Yes, you're just swapping. So, um, uh, so uh, if a is is is, is zero, um, then the answer is going to be one. If a is one, then the answer is going to be zero. You're negating, right? Um, yeah, it's an unary operator, right? It only takes in one value. Yeah. I've, I'm sorry, have, have we not done? We've done Boolean algebra in high school, right? Have we not done Boolean algebra in high school? No. I thought we were glossing over this. I think I thought we did. Uh, yes, sir. No, no, it's not. It's not a. So it's not a literal interpretation of what addition is. But it's, yeah, but but multiplication. So conjunction could be viewed as like actual. Like what ha what typically happens when you're multiplying two input values, like like zero times zero is zero, zero times one is zero, one times zero is zero, one times one is one. Right? But that's but really disjunction doesn't work like that. All right, so 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 remember that for you to understand this, right, it's best viewed from the perspective of uh, a one being mapped onto a true and a false, right? I'm saying for you to be able to better understand what's happening, you could also view the one as being a true and the zero as being a false. It's better that way, I guess. And this is coming up a lot. So you notice that using, using those three different um, operations, we, we can actually pretty much come up or be able to evaluate <laughs> complex expressions, right? Uh, so an expression like, I mean, this is not complex, obviously, it's an easy one. Um, if, we, if we negate A, we know that we're just going to get the opposite of A. We can evaluate this. If we have an expression like uh, applying disjunction on A and B, and then um, and then uh, use the result to, to 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 get the use the result here as input with C, and then apply uh, disjunction here, we can easily evaluate this. Um, oh my goodness! This is so many different things here. It turns out that. Uh, <laughs> It turns out that there's an order, by the way, in which these expressions are supposed to be evaluated, right? So um, negation takes precedence over the others, followed by uh, conjunction and then disjunction. Um, but then if you have something that appears in, in parentheses, obviously that particular expression takes precedence, right? So like in this particular case, we would first of all have to evaluate A, B, and then use this result um, to evaluate the result uh, plus C prime, right? So C prime and then AB and then the result of C prime um, uh, 
uh, when, apply, when we apply disjunction on the result of C prime and the result of uh, AB. Order of execution is negation, conjunction, and then disjunction. Well, actually, first it's bra brackets, and then negation, conjunction, and then disjunction. So when you have a complex expression, these rules must hold, right? You start evaluating from the one on the top going down. Yes? Okay. We haven't started. We haven't started talking about um, logic gates yet. yet. We're just looking at Boolean algebra here, and then uh, subsequent slides will get to explain a lot more how you get, you map the theory around Boolean algebra to implementation of logic gates. So hopefully, can I say we pause for a question and then maybe to be answered as we apply this? Yes, sir. It depends on what the question is, right? I mean, the question could be just, uh, the, the question could be, it could be given value, so you, you might be told to say, uh, come up with the so-called truth table, truth table, which we discuss very soon, actually. Um, so using those two, because remember, fundamentally, when we're dealing with whatever expression we're working with, we are working with two values, either zero or one. Right, so the question could take the form, oh, what, what, what result do we get when we use a different combination of values here? Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, right? Well, like in this case, we have three input values, so it would be zero, 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 one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, all the way, right? Um, okay. Right, so those, those um, it turns out that those, those those operators that we just talked about, so conjunction, disjunction, and negation, um, can actually be used to implement logic gates, right? So-called logic gates. And really there's a one-to-one -one mapping between conjunction and the AND operator, right? So conjunction is the AND operator, so-called multiplication. If you can look at it or view it as multiplication. Um, and then uh, the disjunction is represented by the O operator, uh, negation, is represented by the not operator, right? Um, and then interestingly enough, you can actually derive other components using the, the best gates that we have here. So you can come up with an AND gate by applying um, the not operator to an AND gate, right? So this is a combination of an AND gate and a not gate, right? Um, really the, the, um, the visual representation of uh, so this is a visual representation of, of an AND gate, right? Um, uh, this would be a visual representation of, I'm horrible when it comes to, to drawing, right? This would be like your, <laughs> this would be like your, your O operator, and then this would be like your, this would be like your, your AND, um, I'm sorry, your NOT operator, right? And you notice these two taking two input values, but this only takes in one input value, which could be an A or a B or a C. It doesn't matter, right? Um, and then when you apply something like uh, a NOT gate to uh, an AND gate, what you come up with is a hybrid of the two, which uh, is represented like so. Right? So the only difference here is this uh, circular thing here. Right? Same goes for um, your so-called O operator here when you apply the when you apply the um, the not get to an O get. But there is also what's called an exclusive O operator, right? Um, so it's 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 diff it's different from yes sir. Not,
What you, oh, you, you can't, <laughs> no, there's, there's no such thing. <laughs> no, there's no such thing. Um, you'd have to combine them differently. It would be like you, you'd be taking in, in output coming in from an AND gate and then feeding it into an OR gate, for instance. Right. And there's also an, the exclusive OR gate, right? Uh, we'll see the behavior just now. Um, but the, the difference with uh, an, an XO and an O operator is that um, in the representation is you have um, two curves there. But the difference is that this only returns one if the two input values are different. So it will return a one only if you have a zero and a one and a one and a zero as input values. Right. Sorry? You get a zero. Because the, the answer that you get can either be a zero or a one. Right, so if we are saying this only returns a one when the two input values are different, then you know that if you have a zero and a zero, you get a zero. If you have a one and a one, you get a zero, right? And you notice that using this, I'm going to go now and pretend that we've, uh, I'd promise to name and shame, maybe we'll do that before we part ways. We're almost done here. Bear with me, I, I know that uh, interacting with me has been painful uh, very soon it will be over, it's almost done, right? It's, it's done actually, it's almost done. So if you could just uh, you know, bear with us, uh, let's finish this on a good note. All right, thank you. All right, so using, using these, these different gates here, you can actually come up with complex circuitry, something that will be able to add two numbers, something that will act as a multiplexer. And I, I mentioned this, if, you, if you've been following, right? If you look at these, different gates that we have here. You notice that we can use that to come up with a multiplexer, a two to one multiplexer here. Not and, and, or, right? And, and really all you're doing is you're feeding, you're feeding this multiplexer takes in three input values. And we know this, multiplexer takes in three input values, like the standard multiplexers that we've been discussing, right? Um, the control signal and the two input values, the one that you decide to, to send to the ALU, right? And so you have to do is understand exactly how these different gates can work. Yes? These. And is <coughs> conjunction, or is disjunction, not is negation. The other ones are just derived, and this, this has no corresponding, um, the XO has no corresponding kind of operator. I, I guess it can be linked to the O in Boolean algebra, but it doesn't have like a corresponding operator in Boolean algebra. I don't know if this is, uh, usually, but the symbolic thing would be like, uh, exclusive O be represented like so, a secular plus. If you come across something like this in literature, this is like an exclusive O. And I, I think if you think about it, uh, doesn't think about it. I was trying to link it to what happens in real life, but anyway, it's fine. Okay, so, um, so it turns out that the, the, the different Boolean expressions that you might be working with, or complex circuitry that you'd be working with, can be used to create uh, a so-called truth table, right? Uh, this is like, um, a representation of what sort of output value you get after you apply an operator to the input values that you'd be working with. And we know that the input values can either be a zero or a one. Uh, so given, um, given two input values, for instance, A and B, we can come up with a truth table that will tell us the different types of outputs when we have those different values associated with A and B. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? That's called a truth table. Uh, very simple, very simple table to, to work with. Hopefully my slow pace is better than, ah, oh, it's too fast or something. Very, <laughs> very simple table to work with, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people last year were, Confused. I thought this was probably one of the simplest things, the simplest topics we covered. Only two people, is it two or one person answered? 
the exam question, right? Which is shocking for me, right? Shocking because it was probably the easiest <coughs> question, but hey, to each his own, right? When you have options, tomato or onion, I don't know. Um, so, so what you do is with your truth table is each, each value, each of the values that you work with, and we know that there's only two values, right? Each value, <coughs> Well, it could be two or more values, actually. We are talking about the variables here. Bear with me, the values we're talking about here could be like, if you have an expression as A, B, and C, the values we're talking about are the values corresponding to A, B, and C, the placeholders, right? So each value is represented in a separate column in your truth table. And then you have an additional column for the final output. Uh, so the total number of rows, and this is important, the total number of rows is the different possible combinations of the values. So if you're working with one value, you know that the different possible combinations are two, one or zero. Let's start with the simplest one. If we're working with negation, for instance, let's say um, we're working with um, an odd get. What we're saying is that each value, in this case it's just one value, let's say the value was A here and the output is going to be C, or B, right? Each input value is represented by a separate column. The output is also represented by a separate column. You, you can only have one output, right? And then you have number of rows that map onto the different possible combinations for the input value. For the case of the not gate, you can only have two values, zero or one. Uh, if you're working with uh, a gate, um, I guess, or an expression that has, let's say, two or more input values, uh, the situation kind of changes. So observe, let's say you're working with an expression where you get like a, an AND gate, for instance. You know that you expect two input values, let's say it's A and B, and then an output value of C. Your truth table will comprise of a column for A, a column for B, and a column for the output, which is C. The number of rows is going to be the different possible combinations for the input values. Two input values. It's either both inputs are zeros. The first input, which is A is zero, B is one. Or it's either A is one, B is zero. Or both of these things are going to be ones. <coughs> now, I'm, I'm sure you've already figured out um, yeah, we, we have music classes in, in School of Education. We understand this. Hopefully that's them. Um, there should be a music lab somewhere far away, which is like, a, it's a soundproof or something. But, but uh, you notice here that because you're working with two input values, essentially, you know that the different, you can easily derive the different possible combinations of the input values. Is this going to be two to the power? the number of input values, which is two. This is where the four is coming from. So you know that the different combinations that you're going to be working with is going to be two to the power two. If you're working with a get that, uh, or a circuitry that takes in, um, a circuitry or an expression that takes in, let's say three input values. And by the way, you can have a circuitry that takes in even four or five input values, right? But let's say you're working with uh, a circuitry that is similar to to this here. I'm making things up here, but I guess it will work here. You notice that in this particular case, we have, essentially we have three input values, right? I guess this would be like your intermediate values here and then the output. When you have when you have a situation like this, you know that the different, the, the different values for A, B, and C that you're going to be working with are going to have to be two to the power three. So eight of them. 
right? Yeah, eight of them. Zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, one. Zero, one, zero. Zero, one, one. One zero zero. One one zero. One one one. One two three four five six seven. Ooh, there's something missing. I was deliberately. Um, I was. You see what I was doing here. I'm deliberately doing this because I want you guys to form a connection here. Two to the power two to the power one, right? Essentially, you are working with two values that start from zero to one. If you think about it, the decimal equivalent of these combinations will give you a hint of what sort of binary values you are working with. In this case, this is binary value one, binary value zero one. If you look at what's happening here, this is bin uh, sorry decimal value zero, decimal value one, two, three. This is why I was following a certain order, because this is mapping on to, I mean, it doesn't matter what sort of order, you use. if you want, you can start with four, three, two, one, zero, doesn't matter, but it turns out that, it turns out that it's a lot easier for you to come up with a truth table if you, if you follow this order. Once you're working with three input values, you know that you need to have eight different combinations. Eight different combinations that would be between the values zero up to two minus, up to the power I mean, eight minus one, which is seven. So essentially, you're going to have to come up with these different combinations by just following zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is what I was doing here. This is zero, this is one, right? This is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, uh, this is six, and then this is seven. Right, uh, hopefully this kind of Makes sense here. Um, am, I, am I still too fast? <coughs> hey, don't know. <laughs> so, so here's here's a here's a, a simple walkthrough here, right? If you if you think about the different things that we've spoken about here, whether you're dealing with gates or it's a Boolean expression like this. this by the way, is um. I guess Google Slides is a bit messy here. This is dot or asterisk, you know. <clears throat> so using 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 these things that we're just from discussing, you notice that uh, the different outputs that you get uh, if you have um, input values A and B. If you're working with um, an AND gate or if you're working with conjunction here, you know that. Uh, Zero and zero will give you zero. Zero um, and one will give you zero. One and zero will give you zero. One and one will give you one. Um, zero or zero will give you zero. Zero or one will give you one. One or zero will give you one. One or one will give you one. Not, not zero will give you one. Um, not zero will give you one. Uh, not one will give you zero, not one will give you zero. For B, uh, we're working with this value here, not zero will give you one, not one will give you zero, not zero will give you one, not one will give you zero. Right, like it's just, a, it's a game, right, apparently. It sounds silly, and I'm sure like our two-year-old brothers will be performing better than we do. If, if we were to apply these rules here to a slightly more complex expression or circuitry, because remember this, what we have here, this is a dot by the way, what we have here is, can be viewed as a circuitry also, right? This is an AND gate, this, this represents an OR gate. This bar here represents a NOT gate. Yes? <laughs> but, uh, 
I'm confused here. Uh, if, if you have, um, oh no, oh, the not zero, the not, right? We said that the not get or um, negation is an unary operator. A not get takes, uh, negation is an unary operator, working with negation here. Negation is the same as a not, not get. A not get takes in one input value. So if we are saying we have two input values A and B, for negation it means that we'd have to apply not to A, get the result, and then apply not to B and then get the corresponding result. The, the result for not A is here. here. The input values for not A are 0, 0, 1, 1. What is, what is, what is the input for A in the first instance is 0? Not zero is one. Not, not zero again is one, right? Not one is zero. Not one is another zero. Another way of looking at this is, um, and, and usually when you're, when you're using true instead of one, it's a lot easier. If you know that one represents true and zero represents false, then you know that this is false, false, true, true, right? Not false is true, not false is true, not true is false, not true is false, right? The same goes here. If this is false, true, false, true, not false is true, not true is false, not false is true, not true is false, right? If you have here and, and, and you're working with the and gate, when you have force and force, when you have force here for A and force for B, when you, when you have uh, A and B, you're saying force and force. Force and force is force, right? Force and true, force and true is force. True and force, true and force is force, right? Uh, true and true is true, right? So it's, so it's like, usually when you're working with the truth. <coughs> what? As I said, true and true is true. No, we're working with here. What are you talking about? I was looking at the notes. This represents the AND gate. This represents the O gate. And then this represents <coughs> not get, oh, I wouldn't want to do that, right? Okay. This is usually like, a, here's a question, right? What's that like, uh, what would you get, <laughs> what would you get for, uh, excuse me, an expression, not A uh, plus not B, right? When noted, right? Oh, I don't know, right? and you're coming up with a truth table here. It turns out that you can do this piecewise, right? You first, like we said, the rules, right? The precedence, you start with negation. So if you're working with zero and zero, right? It will be one, one, plus. And then one or one is one. Negation of this is zero. So the answer of this, for this particular combination would be like um, a zero. But so here's, here's a, a, a very simple example I'm going to walk through. Very basic example here. Yep. Yes. This table, the table, are we supposed to model by heart? Uh, to each his own. Uh, you, you can memorize them by heart if you want. Well, so if you are if you are a part of the people that are in engineering, right? Yeah. And you're 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 designing a circuitry that does this, for you to come up with a desired behavior, you'd have to know what output you're going to get from a truth table, right? How are you going to know that? Memorizing is a bad idea because there are a ton of different circuitry that you get to work with. <coughs> no, you can derive this. If you're working with two values, it doesn't matter what sort of gate or expression you're working with. You can easily derive this by just using the input values. Zero. Input values will, will hold value zero or one. Sorry? My question is, the way you give us what is the 
the tables in exam. No, you can't be given a truth table. <laughs> you would you would have to in fact some some questions if you've gone through past past exam questions, some questions actually um, require that you you come up with the different combinations yourself and then you specify the output. Right, so here's a question for you, right? If we are working with uh, uh, a, two, a, a two to one max, for instance, um, what sort of truth table and corresponding output would we have? Go figure, right? Yes. Sorry? Which sign? No, why would it, it shouldn't disappear because what, what you'd be saying by the way, right, is if you came up with, if, if you had this, this particular thing as an example here, uh, as a question, what you're saying here is uh, you have, if you had to create a circuitry for this, what you, you'd be telling a person from engineering to say, implement this for me is, um, you'd be telling them this. <laughs> this is what you're telling them, <laughs> right? This expression is supposed to map onto this. You're saying the inputs from A and B are first going to be noted, right? And then you get the output once you note A and you note B and you feed them into an OR gate. And then afterwards, you note the output again. Sorry? Yeah, this is why we have a note bar here on top. All right, uh, this is easy stuff here, but... No, the, pre the previous slide, the slide that the cell phone had, yes, that the, the input of value x. Yeah. Is it going to go on both sides? Yes. How, how it's going to go on both sides? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does this work? What do you mean, how does it work? Um, like that other one, a two to one. So there are two values, and there are one value. Then what is? No, no, no. What I'm talking about here is not a two to one. I'm saying this particular type of multiplex is a two to one max, which takes in one signal input. In fact, most of these max we've been talking about is this is a type of multiplexer because it turns out that the multiplexer can actually take in two signals. But this example I'm giving here is, is a type of multiplexer that takes in one input line for a signal. And then additional two input lines that correspond to the values that you want the multiplexer to output. <coughs> Look at this. You remember, uh, you remember this? This particular multiplexer takes in an input from, from where? From the sign extent and from the register part. But the way we figure out whether the input we're going to use, this second input for the AAU, the one we're going to use is determined by, there's a control signal here that gets into the max. AAU source. Do you remember that? AAU source, I, I, I said it, AAU source, AAU source. The value of the AAU source would determine whether you're going to, to, to send the, the value coming in from the sign extend or the register file. So essentially what you are saying is this multiplexer here has how many input values? One, two, three. You are working with three input values, which is the same as what we are talking about here. The X would be represented by this ALU source. The A would be maybe the value from the register. The B would be the value from the sign extend. It's just an example I was giving here for how you would implement a multiplexer here. So, so the interesting thing about this is you have to think about, you know, what sort of truth table do you have to come up with here and oh, 
what, what is the output of y? After I come up with a truth table. It turns out something like this is not, uh, and we'll continue the, the example hopefully on, uh, on Sunday. Uh, after church, we shall pray so that we understand. Now, <laughs> yeah, we should, we should go to quite an overnight prayer. Guys, if you think about this, right? The example that we are going to have to look at is, I don't think it's the multiplex, it's probably different, but if you were to come up with a truth table for this, fundamentally you know that you have a column that's going to represent each of the different input values, right? At this point, you already know that because you have three input values, it's two to the power eight, so you need to have eight rows, right? <laughs> I guess we just do this, right? One, two, zero, well, I'll just call this zero, one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the easy part, because all you have to do at this stage is just convert this to binary using three-bit representation. We were not joking when we say bit representation is important. Now we're assuming you understand what it means to bit representation. You come up with these values, right? <laughs> and then you notice here that because you have, you have like intermediate steps in between, it, it would be a lot easier for you to evaluate the output of y if you do this piecewise. You will notice here that the input of x here when diverted towards a is first of all noted. So meaning that the input for a is actually going to be, the input going to A for X is actually going to be X bar, or, or not X. The result of, when you pass X to this, not, not get here, the result that you get here is not X. So meaning that at some stage, one of the intermediate steps you're gonna have to work with is not X. And then once you, once you send A and X here, right, the step that you're going to have to feed to, to this get here, this all get that evaluates to y, is a result of a and not x, right? So you'd have to have a and not x, right? And then you realize again that when you, when you send x to this get here, when it, x is combined with b, you'd be working with x and and B, and, and really these associative rules we are talking about kind of like hold here, by the way guys, we're like saying uh, X and B is the same as B and X. We, we saw this, right? They taught us associative rules and distributive rules here. Um, in grade school, primary school, grade two, right? So finally you realize that for you to get, for you to get the expression Y, you'd have to combine this intermediate step and this intermediate step. So what I was saying is essentially is for you to be able to accurately evaluate the answer here, you'd have to identify the sub expressions that you'd have to work with. And you notice at this stage really, it becomes a lot easier, right? Like for the first input values, when, when all the input values are zero, A zero, B zero, X zero, all you have to do is evaluate what uh, not, not, not false, right, is true. Um, zero and zero, or true and true, uh, sorry, false and false is false. Uh, false and false is false, right? Um, and then you come here, uh, uh, false or false is false. Right? Yeah, and then you do the same for the remaining seven combinations. Is this making sense? Yeah, so. We'll, we'll continue this, uh, there's an example, I don't know if this example is actually a multiplexer though. Don't know. No, it's not the multiplexer, but, but, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not a multiplexer though, but it's fine. All right, uh, see you day after tomorrow when we do a bit of revision uh, for, Try the test.
Where do they teach you to rub the board once you're done? Is it did you ten ten or something? What? Not yet. Now I didn't know. I was told, right? I was shamed implicitly. Say there are people in this meeting we were in. There are people in here that leave the the board dead. Don't do that. That's bad. I was like, it's me. I wanted to raise my hands. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> Where? It's zero. Zero. This is one. So zero is false. This is true. False and true is. No. Are you happy? Happy now. Just that the way you say it, it's like as though there was, there was zero here. Yeah. When you were saying it. No, I was probably referring to this. There is a zero originally here. Yeah. This is the one. Are we supposed to use this one because of the expression? Yeah, we use this, yes. No, as in using A as zero. Uh huh. This one, right? This one. Yes. That's what you mean. Yes. Yeah, I'm saying in your explanation, you say there is no way you're saying it as zero instead of one. Oh, sorry. Now, I'll be forced to play back this recording to check where I said that. Can we start with the person who was first? Yes. The first draft is out and it's still the same. Yeah, I saw that. And it's almost too late now. The land majors are going to have to endure the pain. If I were you, I would already start thinking about um, the food I'm going to take in the venue, what I'm going to eat. No, you must plan. Food. Yeah, in the venue, yes. You're entitled. You go with the food there. But we'll try and see if the final draft can be changed. I'll go and see Mr. Mbula. I saw him right before the timetable was released and he assured me that they had actually written to the registrar's office and they were expecting a change. But I looked at it and there was no change. I was like, don't know. There's little I can do, but at least I try by warning you up front to fix this. But we'll try and see if it can be fixed. But it's doable. Yes. It is the same. Yes. Yeah, because you see the gates are derived. And then O is disjunction. Yes. And then no justification. For O and and. Yeah, so. Yeah, so very soon you'll be able to, maybe we'll discuss how, if we have enough time, we shall discuss how we get to create memory structures. So how do you store data into, because the data you're storing, by the way, you're storing in a circuit like this. It's an electric signal. Sorry? Yes, it's for you. And the last quiz. So, uh, up to lecture series number 20, 23, right? So, we're going to cover the. Sorry, 22. 22, only me, right? Yeah. 19 Yeah, you want to check the slides. There's somewhere in the slides where this was discussed. I also sent out an email with these details, right? You don't read the email, right? Yeah. And you're probably one of those people who doesn't read the table of contents for a book. You just go to the thing, right? If you had read the beginning, the, the slides that have information or announcements, you'd know. Sorry? Check what? The content. It have to 19 up to 22, right? I would, I would suggest that you, I don't want you coming back to me and say that you said this. Check the announcements and the emails. The answers are there. I'm not going to open up my emails to check the mails I sent to you or the slides because you have the slides. What did we say, Andrew or Mwepa? Do you remember what we said? Yes, it's going to cover all the improvements. And, um, it's, it's if you have a baby brother, go there and uh, play, play a game of truth or false, right? True or true? <laughs> You'll be surprised what they teach them. And so, sorry? Yeah. Hi. Sorry, just a second. I'm trying to... 
I'm trying to show this guy something. No, I'm not sticking around. I'm I'm going away. Life is hard. No, you don't. No, no, no. That's a you don't need anyone in life, right? You need yourself. That's the thing. You need only yourself. Um, Okay, so, uh, so, uh, you just do a little bit of like one in No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm attending a meeting, so I have to rush in. Can you can you can you do me a favor and uh, upload the uh, upload that one on the GC hub the the Do you see this? Go go and read lecture series number twenty one. Oh sorry, this is the take home quiz. Sorry. Hi. Sorry? What's the plus It's all. It's plus. Well, there's no plus here because the, the only the only expression that involves the plus is the last bit where you you'd have to plus a times not x plus x times b for you to find y so in fact what what the smart people will do is uh check your mails i don't have it in the slides i can't remember where i put it here does anyone remember where we where we discussed what was coming in test test number can't remember where I well, but I've mentioned this in class as well. Yeah, the contents that's going to go into four. Yeah. Not the data We should bring data part maybe, but no. Yes. Yes. Oh. 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 No, I'm trying to balance. I'm trying to data part. So for the question that you were asking, right? The, the smart people would have to, if I were you, I'd probably come up with an expression that says, um, excuse me, I'd have to come up with uh, an expression maybe Q, I'd, I'd say Q, Q is equal to this, and then uh, P is equal to this, and then Q is equal to this. And then before Y, you'd have P, and then you'd have Q, and then you'd have Y, right? So, so that um, Y is essentially going to be equal to P plus Q. It's, it's, yeah, it's fine. It's just like, it can be confusing if you're working with um, a much more complex expression. So you want to, for some people, right, some smart people will just go up to, you have A, B, and X, and then you derive the truth table without a problem. Right, so you don't, you don't, some people don't need this necessarily. You just work with the input values and then you, you go back, but, I don't know. For what? For, for all the different combinations? Can't be. That's what. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> X bar. X bar. So, so, so listen, wait, pause for a while. I can already think of, uh, you see, without really going through the entire truth table, I can already think of a scenario where you get the y equal to 1. Think about this for a second. Uh, work with um, 1 for a, 
um, zero for x. One for b. So x bar is going to be equal to one. A is one, so it's one times one, which is one. Mm -hmm. Which is one. Then x is what? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, B is one. So this is one, right? So we have one. This is zero. Zero. There's bound to be, yeah. Uh huh. So really? Oh, is it the one? Okay. What? What is? What gate comes before the output of what? Hi. Where we have? Because we are following, we are following what's here. The reason why we have negation is because output is being directed towards. You see that this is. You notice that this is. This is O, right? P O Q. The result coming from here is going to be awed by the result coming from here. So in instances where you have a, a one or a, a one zero or zero one for these expressions, you will get a one here. Like this is a classic example for this particular example where we have one here and zero. Because this this is this, right? What you are what you are for this particular input, the expression a and not x is is evaluated by this, right? This is a and not x. What is the answer for that? It's one, right? So you have one. And then you have x, which is zero, and one, which is zero, right? One or zero is what? One or, this is o. One or zero is one. So you see where you can't get all zeros for the Wait, expression. Like you're this after getting no, we're not doing this here. <laughs> Work with this expression. Look at this. Go through this. You have one, one, zero as input, right? Yes. This expression, what is one and one? It's one. What is zero and one? It's zero. For you to get y, you have to do one or zero. Yeah, but it's in here, not there, right? Yeah. So one or zero. What is one or zero? Yeah. One. Which is why I was telling someone for you to to work through this um, without any problems, you have to make sure that you don't evaluate this expression. Give feed this to a variable, like say, oh, I'm I'm going to call this p, right? So I will evaluate p separately. So whatever answer I'll get here, I'll call it p. One, uh, one and one is one, so I know that this one is my p. Zero and one is zero, so I know this zero is a q. And then for me to get y, y is essentially a subprocess that is just equal to p or q. And then you just say, oh, this is true or false, which is true. Good. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't have more than one output. <laughs> Look at the fundamental gates we're working with. Were you guys paying attention? Sorry? There's what? Yeah, but the output is just going to be one. Because, you see, even if it's a complex expression that you're working with, but fundamentally, the output is just going to be one. Except for your, for your, for your adder, right? When, when you discuss the adding component, you realize that if you think about how addition works, for instances where you, because you have three inputs, right? The carry in bit, input value, input value. So for instances where you have these threes, do you remember what we did when we we're adding three zeros? One, one, one plus one plus one is one, remainder one. So for an adder, like if you are to implement a hardware component that adds, 
you, it would output two values, but using two separate gates. One output is going to be the carry bit, one output is going to be the actual output. For you to implement like it's a 32-bit add or something, right? One-bit add would be easy, though, but is this making sense? Uh, see you when you see me. Yes, Miss Esther. So there are some people are going to be specialized. Esther from the Bible. In what? <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, it means that it's everyone, but they take everyone. For, you see, do you remember what, what I said when we, this, when we first started this? I said, the reason we're doing all of this is, what is the broad goal of this course? To understand how a computer performs computations. This ends at first, there's no course that you're going to do that involves computer architecture, right? Maybe if you are in engineering or computer science, they have like these other advanced courses. But for us, we're just trying to understand, because it turns out if you understand how a computer does these things, it becomes a lot easier for you to learn how to program using a high level programming language because you understand what's going on behind the scenes. That is the goal of this thing. Well, aside from the fact that uh, some of you are going to be like light on and stand for one hour in front teaching and talking, right? Uh, so you have to know these things for you to teach other people, right? Uh, but life becomes so easy if you understand this. These are fundamental. It's like uh, you can't learn calculus if you haven't been taught basic algebra on how to add numbers and whatnot. You know, the same thing. But yes. 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 That would be cheating. No, 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 not really. It would be like um. Doctor Layton, say something about this. I know what you're saying. You're saying uh, make it fair. Easy. That's what you're saying. Is fair. It? No, no, not fair. What? Test four apparently. The the tests are always fair. If you one way of trying to 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 assess whether or not the tests are fair is at this stage, go back to test one and ask yourself and be honest with yourself. Ask yourself. Was test one fair? Go to test number two and ask yourself this question at this stage. Was test two fair? You realize that in all these different instances, you say, oh, it was fair. And at this point in time, if I were you, I'd go to last year's exam and ask yourself, was this exam fair? You realize that it was fair. Why is it fair? Because the questions that are asked are based on the content because that we're discussing in class. It's like test one and test two be different from this because uh, we'll be writing programs. Yes. The programs will take time. For example, you say, no, it's 45 minutes. And then right. you, you've, been, uh, you've asked us to write a program which will take maybe eight minutes. No, minutes. so again, if you, if you look at the questions that, um, thank you for reminding us, maybe we should change this time around. If you look at the questions, thank you so much, Esther. I really appreciate your feedback. But if you look at the, honestly, yeah, seriously though, if you look at uh, the questions from last year, She's insisting that we should write programs, which we should, I think. No, 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 the question is two, and then it's just 45 minutes, and you want us to answer all the questions. <laughs> no, not about that. If you look at last year's tests and qu tests, especially, mm -hmm. and the exam, there's no question where people were, say, were asked a question that was hypothetical, like, uh, like this, not hypothetical, but a question like uh, what came in the, what do you call this? The, um, the quiz, say, so write a program. Nowhere, right? Do you ever come across that question? Yeah. It's just small chunks of call, right? You're being assessed to see if you understand. But, but I think to, to maybe change things like this. I'm not sure she did. This didn't mean don't. In fact, don't uh, don't oh, go in the WhatsApp one group one and say Esther did this to me. No. If you what? Have you read the rules? Be <laughs> <laughs> expelled. Yes. Yeah. But time. Right. Right. That will be considered. Enough time for thinking. Time when you write writing the code, you have to think. That is true. What time? So people keep mentioning writing the code. What do you mean? Ladies and gentlemen, I will see you when you see me.